Hear this prayer for all of us with thanks to Kate Bowler and Jessica Ritchie. Oh God, we stretch out our hands to you this Easter morning. We need you to pull us up and set us on our feet again. Bless us who stretch out our hands to you in doubt and grief, in sickness of body and mind and spirit, when our prayers are not fully realized and yet we rejoice anyway. For that is what makes us Easter people, carrying forth the realized hope of the resurrected one, singing our alleluias great and small while it is still dark. Amen. Let's be seated. Good morning. So good to be with you, to welcome you, those gathered in this glorious place, those joining us via technology as we celebrate Easter in this everything, everywhere, all at once world. And it's a lot to hold, you know? I was cheering for that movie to win Best Picture, Sight Unseen, because of the title alone. It sums up, doesn't it, what life is like sometimes. I'm praying for all of us right now, especially for you, that you receive here the hope that God longs for you, that you may live your life with joy and purpose, grace and generosity of spirit in your everything, everywhere, all at once, life. I'm so glad you're here. Let me begin by placing what we've gathered to celebrate today within a larger frame of spiritual quest and practice, the rhythms and rituals created to help us find meaning and connection to the mystery we call God. So on the big canvas of life and society, all religious traditions, including Christianity, establish ways of marking time according to the calendar of seasons and celebrations that are linked to the Earth's travel around the sun and also highlight events from a given religious narrative. And the narrative, whichever one it is, is rooted in historical memory, yet holds spiritual significance that transcends time and space. And so religious celebrations like this one are never only about remembering the past, for they invite us through the lens of past events to look within and around for authentic spiritual encounter now and to point us toward a future that lies beyond the horizons of our sight. And most of the time, in the frenzy of everything and everywhere all at once, we are, to our detriment, oblivious to this deeper rhythm. But it's there for us whenever we stop long enough to watch and listen for it and to drink from those deeper wells. That there is considerable overlap across religious traditions, such that people of different faiths have similar celebrations at the same time, shouldn't surprise us. The synchronicities are reassuring, pointing to the fact that we're all onto something that's real. The Franciscan priest Richard Rohr makes the case that Christ is universal. It's not that everyone is Christian, but the truth of Christ, the life force we find in Christ, isn't only available for those who follow Jesus of Nazareth. And if that truth finds expressions in other ways, on other paths, praise the God who loves diversity and shows no partiality. For in all our differences, we are one human race. 
And this fragile earth, this beautiful, fragile earth, is the island home for us all. Yet, in spiritual practice, there is what's known as the, um, the scandal of particularity, which is to say, if you want a spiritual life of any depth at all, you need to claim your particular path, or perhaps better said, acknowledge the path that has claimed you and walk it. Otherwise, you risk being enslaved to superficiality and all manner of distraction that will gladly keep you running on other people's hamster wheels for the rest of your life without inner adequate strength and wisdom to stop, get off, and find your true call. So speaking particularly then, Christians circle the sun each year, commemorating the big events in the life of one man, Jesus of Nazareth, and reflecting on his teachings. The bulk of each year is spent on the ladder in the long seasons our Roman Catholic friends call ordinary time. And during that time, we gather at church on Sundays or small groups in our homes or in private devotion and acts of service, slowly making our way through the repository of Jesus' teachings found in the Bible and attempting to apply them to our own lives. And in doing so, there's a lot of repetition and rehearsing of familiar tales and his great one-liners because Jesus' teachings aren't the kind you, you, know, you read once and are done with. They're meant to take up residence inside us and become the worldview and the lens through which we attempt to live Jesus-inspired lives. And we proclaim that the scriptures are inspired by God, not because they're without factual error or contradiction, but because they are the repository of peoples across generations who have attempted to put into words and metaphor their encounters. And sometimes as we read, we experience an encounter. The words seem to leap off the page and into our hearts and we hear an invitation through them sometimes, a specific one, to live and to love as Jesus loves and to claim his values as our own, compassion, forgiveness, solidarity in suffering, respecting the worth and dignity of every human being, pursuing justice through nonviolent means, and sacrificial love. So the point isn't to learn more about Jesus. The point is to become more like him. As we, over time and in struggle, place, learn to place our trust in him, in his forgiveness, in his love, and draw strength from his courage. And there's no shortcut here, you know? This is a journey of a lifetime. So these commemorative celebrations, like today, in the Christian year, they're like, um, they're like bells tolling to get our attention and inviting us to stop and consider one big spiritual truth encapsulated in a key event in Jesus' life that if we choose, can become part of ours. And two such celebrations stand out in significance. We celebrate his, his birth at Christmas as the coming of God into the world, into our world as it is, and to us as we are. And this week, 
we have commemorated the events culminating in Jesus' death. And we need several days to do this, beginning on the Thursday of Holy Week, when we place ourselves at the table where he shared a last meal with his friends and washed his, their feet and said to them, by extension to us, I've given you a new commandment, that you love one another as I have loved you. Then comes the long night he spends in prayer and we do our best to stay awake as he asks God to spare him the inevitable suffering to come. And on Friday, we linger over the worst of it, the worst day of all, all of his male disciples at least desert and deny and betray him and the women are standing by helpless and scared while he's beaten and put to death, even though his crucifiers know that they are killing an innocent man. There's nothing good about what happens to Jesus on so-called Good Friday, but it is impossible not to be in awe of him as we remember that day. Father, forgive them, he prays. Forgive them. They do not know what they are doing. Until his last breath, Jesus chooses the path of love. Until his last breath. And then there's a day of nothing at all, which is a good thing, because grief is exhausting. But, but then, while the grief is still fresh, while it's still dark, Easter morning comes. Morning comes, and, and Mary goes to the tomb and is stunned by what she doesn't see. And so she runs, and she gets two of Jesus' closest disciples to join her, or, you know, that's what von, one version of the story says. There are several, and they don't match up well. And you put them alongside each other, and you just, there's just no sense to be made of it. Um, and what they have in common, it seems, is an overriding sense of chaos and confusion. And of these accounts, Rowan Williams has this to say, we read of fear, grief, doubt, the consistent echo of disorientation and surprise, and the piercing note of shock. Now, mind you, here's the amazing thing. All these stories that we're reading, right, were written down a generation or more after this day with the explicit intention of convincing people like you and me that this was the most important thing that happened to Jesus, the most important thing to know about him. And even though Jesus apparently tried to prepare everybody that this was going to happen, nobody, according to these stories, saw it coming. And those who lived to tell the tale couldn't bring themselves to tidy up the rawness of their experience. And those who later took those stories and wrote them down didn't even attempt to bring coherence and clarity to what had been handed down to them. I don't know about you, but given the chaos and confusion in my life, I find all of this strangely reassuring. Two points upon which the chaotic, confusing accounts agree. Just two. The tomb was empty. Jesus was dead. And the tomb was empty. And then, Jesus encountered his disciples in resurrected form. Now, I have no idea what a resurrected person looks like, but it's pretty clear that he wasn't resuscitated, that resurrection is a different category entirely, which I think explains why none of them recognized him at first. It wasn't until Jesus said Mary's name that she knew who he was. It wasn't until Jesus broke bread with the two disciples on the road to Emmaus that they knew. 
It wasn't until Jesus assured Simon Peter three times that he was forgiven for the three times he denied Jesus that he knew. And it wasn't until Thomas the doubter a week later touched the wounds in his risen body that he knew. When do you and I know? Now there's a mystery. It's said that faith is more caught than taught, which suggests that it comes to us as well in the form of some encounter, generally mediated by another whose story of how Jesus encountered them and the difference it made speaks to us. Or we see such faith lived in another and we find ourselves wanting what they're having. Right? I, um, I met a man a few weeks ago sitting at dinner and he told me that when he converted to the Roman Catholic Church, his friend gave him four volumes of the lives of the saints. And the man said to him, welcome to the church. The saints are the best part of us. And he didn't mean one-dimensional characters that have like no fun at all. He meant the earthy, robust people whose gritty lives somehow communicate something of the love and grace of Jesus, right? And we, and we catch it. And he comes to us, or he comes to us when we're running in the other direction, or when we're at the bottom of some mess of our own making or what others have done to us. He comes to us, calls us by our name. If Jesus had only come to take our sins away, and be in solidarity with human suffering. His mission would have ended on the cross. But it didn't end there. Because his mission, his purpose, wasn't just to die for us. He came to live for us. He came to live. And to, and to enable us to live fully in this world and to join him in ways large and small in the healing of it. Resurrection is God's promise that death is not the end because our God is a God of life and of life that can rise from death. Resurrection is God's promise to us that life as we know it is not the end, that there is another realm, and there is some sweet sound going down on the night train. We have another home, and we're not alone. Resurrection is what makes it possible for Jesus of Nazareth, a man who lived over 2,000 years ago, to be more than a historical figure for us to learn about and admire from arm's length. He can be a living presence, both personal and communal. He can save us. He can be there for us. He both loves us unconditionally and invites us, invites us to walk with him on a path of sacrificial love for the sake of other people. We don't have to ask him to love us. That's a given. We don't have to accept him as our savior for him to save us. That's his way. But the invitation stands, and it's a free choice with no threats of punishment if we choose otherwise, because his invitation is made in love. Jesus' resurrection is what we celebrate today, and it's, and it's a big deal, right? Big deal to merit all that we're doing, all that we can bring to it, all this extravagant splendor. But for those who cho choose to follow him, 
It's one day, alongside a whole bunch of others. So, you know, most of us will be here next week to gather around this table, or we'll be somewhere else around another, and we will take up his stories and teachings once more, considering our life in light of his, striving to live his way of love. And we show up most Sundays. We say our prayers each day as best we can. We study his teachings because, because we need to every day. We do our best to go where he sends us, where love is needed. And we do all this because we've chosen to follow him, because we've come to love him. And we refuse to allow the cynicism and mean-spiritedness and brazen abuse of him by others to sway us from his true path. He's the source of our strength and the strength of our life. And because he lives, so can we in this everything, everywhere, all at once world. And more than live, we can live with joy and we can live with hope. So he's knocking at your door today door of your heart for the first time, for the thousandth time, let him in. If he's inviting you to take one step further on the path of love, even though it's hard, why don't you take it? If there's death in your life, I am so sorry. And I pray that this day you may sense some stirring of life rising from that place, as he promises it will, because he loves you. He's here for you, and he's grateful for you. He's glad you're here, and so am I, because in you and in me, in all of us, and in followers of Jesus around the world, he lives. He lives. And so do we. Amen.